All right, here we are. Uh, this is um, the uh, series entitled Getting to Know You, God. This is lesson number four in that series. And the title of this lesson is The God Who Listens. Start off with a question, a question that we often ask ourselves. Um, have you ever wondered if God is really listening? Now I know that we, we believe you know, in our heads that God is there and He wants us to pray. But how many times have you prayed and it seemed like nothing happened? Um, uh, in James chapter 5 uh, verse uh, 16, James talks about prayer. He says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. But doesn't it seem that sometimes our prayers no matter how fervent, no matter how faithful, no matter how righteous, they kind of come back to us empty. I think all of us have had that experience. And in this series you know, of getting to know God and getting to know His character and so on and so forth, I think it's important to discuss this idea of, of prayer, of communication uh, with Him. So I'll give you an example. We pray and we pray, but the person we're praying for dies anyways. Or we pray fervently and the marriage that we're praying for falls apart anyways. And we continue to pray and pray, but the company closes down or the, the illness continues anyway. And we pray and we ask God fervently for help and the direction that you're asking for in your life just doesn't come and you go ahead and make a decision and make a mistake anyways. You know, we've all had that kind of experience in our, in our prayer life. You know, is God really listening to us? So when these things happen, it becomes easy to doubt one of God's most wonderful qualities, the fact that He's listening and has mercy towards us, because it seems you know, there's no answer to our, to our prayers. So when we're in this position, it's comforting to know that we're not alone. I don't have you know, a magic answer to that. Well, not magic, but I don't have you know, just an answer to all of that. But I do know that we're not the only ones that have experienced this kind of, uh, this kind of dilemma uh, in our prayer life where God is asking us to pray, encouraging us to pray, and we do, and it doesn't seem that He's, that he's really listening to us. Well, other people in the Bible have had the same kind of experience, so I think it, it would do as well to examine someone who's had this kind of experience to see how he handled it and how God handled him. A good example, again, uh, is Jeremiah, Jeremiah and Lamentations. Um, this is a great example of this, this doubt in prayer uh, expressed in the book of Lamentation written by Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah wrote this lament after the destruction of Jerusalem by the uh, Babylonian army. And let me give you just a little background here on this particular uh, event so we understand what's going on. At that particular time, the southern kingdom of Judah had to pay tribute or tax, if you wish, to the Babylonian kingdom who were the world power at the time. Uh, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, at a certain point in time decided to break this agreement with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and stop paying the tribute to throw off the yoke of taxation and just you know, rebel against the king. Well, of course, the Babylonians responded quickly by surrounding Jerusalem in 588 BC for about a year and a half. And eventually the people of the city were starved out and killed and the, uh, the Babylonians burnt the city uh, to the ground. And so in the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah describes the scenes and the feelings of the people during this particular siege. So we'll just read a few verses in chapter one, uh, verse uh, one, two, and three of this book of Lamentation. He says, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. She has become like a widow who was once great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. She weeps bitterly in the night and her tears are on her cheeks. She has none to comfort her among all her lovers. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile under affliction and under harsh servitude. She dwells among the nations, but she has found no rest. 
all, uh, uh, all her pursuers have overtaken her in the midst of distress. So this is the, the beginning of the lamentation concerning the destruction of uh, Jerusalem and its people. Then in chapter two uh, of Lamentation, Jeremiah describes God as the one who is actually doing this to Jerusalem. And he uses this, this, this method simply uh, because he, 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 he understands that God is allowing the Babylonians to do it. Uh, and the point he's making here is, he has prayed and prayed and prayed that this not happen to the city, to the, to the nation, and yet it has happened anyway. So let's see what he says in chapter two, verse one. He says, how the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud of his anger, in his anger. He has cast from heaven to earth the glory of Israel and has not remembered his footstool in the day um, of, his, uh, of his anger. And so here he's attributing to God the, the end result of this. God has permitted this terrible thing to happen. And so in this and other chapters, Jeremiah describes the terrible suffering experienced by the people. And if we were to you know, read through the books, we, we, we would see some of the scenes that he describes. You know, people dying of starvation, mothers killing and eating their, their, their own children, you know, tales of uh, terms of, uh, of cannibalism taking place in chapter four, actually, verses nine and 10. Now he also describes his own feelings about God because of the things that have happened in Jerusalem. This he continues to talk about in chapter three. We don't have time in this lesson to read all about that, but he talks about the physical suffering and the emotional trauma that he personally has experienced and the spiritual despair uh, that he feels because of what has taken place. Now remember, Jeremiah has prayed that this not happen and this has happened. So now he's kind of you know, expressing his thoughts uh, because of the terrible tragedy that has taken place. So let's kind of summarize here. Here you have Jeremiah, a righteous man who has done God's will. He's a believer and he has dedicated his life to serving the Lord. And for his trouble, his people are dying in the streets in a horrible way. His nation is taken over by ungodly people and ultimately destroyed. His church, or the temple, is desecrated and his own body and emotions are put through intense suffering. And this is a person of faith. This is a person of constant prayer. All of this is happening to him. And all of this, all of this, as I said, taking place contrary to the prayers that he, that he makes. Now, in the middle of his crisis, Jeremiah rises up and he expresses his continuous belief that despite the pit of suffering that he is in at the moment, his God is actually a God of mercy and love. And so we read about that in chapter three, and I think you'll find the verses familiar. He says the following, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I have hope in Him. Doesn't that sound like that familiar, uh, that familiar hymn that we sing, I will have hope in Him? Well, this is taken, or that, that hymn is taken from Lamentations in chapter three. So Jeremiah, you know, if you're looking at his situation, he was beaten, but he wasn't broken. He was down, as we say, but he wasn't out. Because he understood three things about God and his relationship with God in times of trouble, and that's where the lesson comes in. Remember I said we can learn things you know, from Jeremiah. Here's a man who suffered great despair, a man of prayer whose prayers weren't answered. You know, how did he deal with that? Well, we learn about him and his attitude about you know, God seemingly not hearing his prayers through his experience. So here's a couple of things that, um, that uh, Jeremiah understood about uh, God. First of all, he understood that God was sometimes silent, but he was always uh, present. You know, he was silent, but he wasn't absent. 
You know, we are, we're, we're a generation today, we're a generation that, that we're used to speed, right? Everything has got to come quickly or else we discard it. And the reason for this is that we're subject to time. We just have so much time to live. And so it's precious to us. Time is precious. You know, the clock is always ticking. That's why we're impatient. That's why we're ready to move on to something else. We don't have, what's our, the saying? For, I don't have time for this. I don't want to waste my time with this. That's why we want things right away. But we have to understand, as far as time is concerned, that God is not subject to time. He moves and accomplishes His will with perfect timing, but He is not distracted or pressured by time, like we are. For us, everything, you know, everything we do has a time element to it. We either have to move quickly or slow down, or you know, we, we may be late or early with God. He's never late, He's never early, He's not subject to time. And because of this, because of this difference, um, we sometimes mistake God's silence for His absence. You know, people say, well, where was God you know, when this happened? When I prayed for my grandchild who was sick or when I prayed that our marriage uh, survived, you know, where was God? Well, He was there. His lack of action in our care is not necessarily mean a lack of love for us. Even though God seemed to be silent in answer to Jeremiah's prayer, Jeremiah knew from God's dealings with him and the Jewish nation throughout history that he wasn't absent. He was there. So when our lives are surrounded you know, by troubles, our bodies and spirits are wasted by constant trials and our prayers seem to be falling on deaf ears, that's the hard part. Remember that God may be silent for the moment, but He is still God and He is still there. This sentiment is expressed beautifully on a wall in Cologne, Germany, scrawled there during the insanity that was World War II and the graffiti on the wall said, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I don't feel it. I believe in God even when He is silent. Right? I like that line about, you know, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. There are some days, right, you don't see the sun at all. But you know the sun is there. You have hope that maybe tomorrow or the next day the sun will break out. In the same way, you know, I, I believe that God is there even if He's not breaking out, even if the clouds in my life are, are hiding Him from view. I don't hear Him. He may be silent, but He's not absent. A second thing. Jeremiah understood um, is that um, um, when he was beset with trouble, when Jeremiah was beset with trouble, he needed to let God know. You know so, so many times when we pray, we, we offer God solutions to our problems or we complain about our problems rather than just pouring out our hearts before God um, with our problems just stating what they are and talking about how we feel about them, whether we're discouraged or we're uncertain or you know, whatever it is. You know, some people, they see the book of Lamentation, this book that we're basing our lesson on today, they see this book of Lamentations as a man whining and complaining about tragedy. But the book of Lamentations is the work of a man pouring out his heart and soul before God in times of trouble. He's not holding anything back. If he's angry, he's saying, I'm angry about this situation, or this is a terrible situation, or this is unjust over here, or I'm, I'm becoming impatient and waiting for you, God, and so on and so forth. You know, he's not telling God what to do. He's telling God how he feels. There's, there's a difference. So human beings need to experience grief when trouble comes. We know that, you know, the five stages of grief, denial. You know, we, we, we need to go through the grieving process. And part of that experience is the pouring out of our heart and souls of the pain and the frustration and anger and fear that is generated by the tragedy that we are experiencing. You know, Peter says in 1 
Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he says, well, the whole verse says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time. And the key point here, casting all your anxiety upon Him because He cares for you. See, all of Jeremiah's weeping and review of his problems before God, that didn't change the situation, but it did change Jeremiah. You see the importance different, the important difference there? Once Jeremiah got the hurt out, he was able to relate to his God once again. He was able to get perspective again. He was able to hope again for a better tomorrow. You've got to get the hurt out in order to get the hope in. That's, that's the problem. When we go through tragedy or you know, trials, troubles, whatever, the big problem is those things fill us up with grief, fill us up with resentment and anger. We're so full, we have no room for hope. We have no strength for patience. So it's important to get that stuff out in prayer, just to lay it out in prayer, to empty it out so that there will be room for hope. There will be room for patience. There'll be room for perseverance. That's the, that's the you know, spiritual work that needs to take place when we go through difficult times and all of our prayers are not changing the situation because it might just be that God is not interested in changing the situation, He's interested in changing you. So when we hurt, we need to let God know. As I said, part of the healing comes from the action of emptying ourselves of the details and feelings associated with our problem and pouring them forth before God, who loves us and who will have mercy on us. All right, another thing, Jeremiah understood was that God had a purpose. This is so important, this idea of understanding and accepting that God has a purpose. The people of Judah were being, at the time you know, when this attack took place, the people of Judah were being polluted by idols and corruption and they were you know, drifting away from God because of these things. This drifting away was jeopardizing God's overall plan of bringing the Messiah to the world through these Jewish people. If they continued in their idolatry and sinfulness, they would abandon the word of God, they would ultimately abandon the temple worship that was so necessary to give meaning to the work of the Savior when He would come. And this was jeopardizing the plan of God to save us and them, of course. And so the destruction of the Jewish people and the, the, uh, the exile that they suffered, you know, they were sent to Babylon, they were carried off to Babylon for 70 years. This terrible thing, seen in perspective, accomplished several very important things in God's plan. First of all, it, um, it uh, preserved a small group of Jews who remained faithful and were purified through their trials in exile. Yes, a small group left, and while they were there, they became strong in their faith, and they did away with and so on and so forth, so that they could be sent back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to start life over again. You know, God takes a remnant, and then He, re, he plants it over again. Secondly, it was during the time of the exile that the synagogue system began and it served the Jewish people so well as they traveled and settled in various foreign nations later on. Um, um, at the time of the uh, Babylonian uh, uh, captivity and attack and so on and so forth, um, people went to Jerusalem to, to, to pray, to, to offer sacrifice. Their whole religion was centered at the temple in Jerusalem. When the city was destroyed and the temple was destroyed, the people carried off into exile, they still had faith. They still had access to the word of God. They still wanted to pray. And so they began meeting, what, you know, what, did, what do you think they did? They began meeting in homes. They began meeting in places because they couldn't offer sacrifice. They couldn't go to the temple. It wasn't there. 
And so the synagogue, right, the place of prayer, you know, began to develop while they were in exile. And when they returned to Jerusalem, they brought back this idea of the synagogue and began establishing these in all of the villages and cities uh, in and around Jerusalem. And then of course later as they, uh, as they moved, as they spread out, as, they, as Jews went from place to place throughout the empire of Rome, uh, they established these synagogues wherever they, wherever they went. Well this idea of establishing a synagogue uh, uh, only you know, uh, took place while they were in captivity. It was uh, the, something that was born of necessity. They didn't need it when the temple was there, but then they needed it when they were in exile. And it was this network of foreign synagogues that Paul used to establish the first churches in the Roman Empire six centuries later. That was part of God's plan. And then another thing that took place because of uh, their exile, the Jewish people never again went into idolatry after this exile. This punishment taught them a lesson that they would never forget. And so Paul says that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8 verse 28. And so the suffering that Jeremiah witnessed and felt was used by God to accomplish his purpose. And in this we get a better understanding of what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So let's dissect this verse here a little bit. First of all, God uses, what does Paul say? All things for his purpose, purposes. All things, that includes the good and the bad. God uses the good and the bad in my life for His purposes. Not just the good, but the good and the bad. Secondly, He uses them for His purpose, not our purpose. And this is the part that's difficult to understand many times. We become discouraged because we cannot see the why and the wherefore of our suffering at times. Uh, and why? Because God isn't explaining it to us. But who said that God was using the, offense, uh, the events rather, that cause us hurt to serve us? The Bible says that He uses all things for His purpose and His purpose may not include us at the moment. You see, the Jews who suffered the loss of home and family and died in exile did not know that their pain would serve others down the road. But it did. It served others six centuries later. If they tried to understand, you know, how is God using this? You know, how is meeting in homes and praying, how is that any better than meeting at the glorious, fabulous temple with the priests and the ceremonies? How is that any better? How, you know, how, what is God thinking? And of course, His ways are much higher than our ways. We can't understand what He's thinking. We, however, today, from hindsight, oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and so it's very important to remember that God may be using things in our lives not to serve us, but to serve somebody we don't know, or to, uh, for a purpose at a time long after we're gone. Okay? All right, so all things are used, all things are used for His purpose, right? And in His good time. You know, we want His purpose to serve us and we want it to serve us right away so we can connect the dots. But God uses something in one century to serve the good of another in another century or another place or another language. Walking by faith requires us to endure the trials in our lives even when we don't see how and for whom God will use these things. What does the writer say in Psalm 56 verse 8 that's there on the screen? Thou hast taken account of my wanderings, put my tears in a bottle, are they not in thy book? You know, it should be enough that we know that God has His plan and that He weaves every event, <clears throat> excuse me, good or bad, He weaves every event into His plan 
for His glory and for our ultimate good. And our ultimate good, what is our ultimate good? Our ultimate good is our salvation. He's weaving things according to His plan, not to make us rich or famous or comfortable or secure here in this world. He's weaving everything into His plan to make sure that we are saved and we stay saved. That's, that's His end game. You know, we often say, all things work for good. Oh wow, I found, a, I found a new car. Well, that's good for you, but God's ultimate plan is not for you to get a good deal on a new car. God's ultimate plan is for you to go to heaven. That's His ultimate plan. And everything is working towards that, towards that end. So when my life seems to be out of control, when my hopes are in ashes, when my nights never ending, it is comforting to realize that my life is not wasted. God can and will fit it into His purpose. Doesn't the psalmist say, my tears are in His bottle? It's another way of saying that all my sufferings He's aware of. And, and all my sufferings are in His book. So He knows. He may be silent, but He knows. And He, he does care. So in our you know, when I do a, a grief support class, we've done those here several times, you know, grief support, support those who are grieving. I always tell my group, don't be surprised when trouble comes. I mean, it always comes. You just never know when it comes. You know, we're always surprised by trouble, right? But we shouldn't be surprised for the fact that trouble you know, enters our life. I mean, we're human. We live in a sinful, imperfect world. We're bound to run into trouble at some point or another. Sometimes, however, when trouble comes and it seems that all that you've heard and learned about God does not ring true because your trouble seems for the moment greater than your God. You know what I'm saying? When you're overwhelmed with your trouble, that your trouble overwhelms your prayers, overwhelms your faith. Try to remember a couple of things. First of all, remember, don't, don't mistake God's silence for His lack of love. Remember what we said, God is sometimes silent, but He's never absent. So we shouldn't mistake His silence for lack of love or concern or His ability to act. Number two, when we're overwhelmed, remember, you need to unburden your heart before God if you are to heal, it's part of the healing process. All right, not telling him what to do or laying out options that you'd like happen or just simply put the troubles and how you feel about the troubles and how you are discouraged and so on and so forth, you know, put that before him. Sometimes you know, we can't fix what's broken or done but fervent prayer to God is always a medicine to the heart. Remember, the, the hurt has to go out before the hope comes, comes in. Very important thing. And then thirdly, remember that God has a purpose. Now, it's not so much that God has a purpose for your life, but that God has an overall purpose and your life will fit into His purpose if you offer it to Him um, in faith. You know, a lot of times we're saying to God, what's your plan for my life? You know? Instead of saying, what's your plan for my life? The question should be, how can my life, Lord, serve your plan? See, less self-centered, more God-centered. Not, what's your plan for my life? but how can my life serve your plan? And you get more answers making that particular prayer. So I do encourage you to keep trusting in God, keep praying to God, even if you can't hear or see Him working in your life. And consciously offer the life that you do have, in whatever shape it's in, to God for His purposes. One last thing to remember, very important, God does not expect a perfect life from us. He's already received one from Jesus Christ. He simply wants your life in whatever condition it's in so He can use it in the way that He sees fit. 
And we can be absolutely sure in the end that His plan will be completed. And when His plan is completed, those who are faithful to Him uh, will have joy and have eternal life. So let's take courage uh, in the fact that uh, our lives are fitting into God's plan, no matter uh, what type of difficulties that we're facing. Okay, so that's our lesson on the God who, the God who listens. Next time we get together, uh, do lesson number five, be the final uh, lesson in this series. I thank you for your attention.